Coming up, stories from four crofters in the north of Scotland. The story of Caithness yarn, floral diversification, the social enterprise providing a farming education, and one farmer's advice to his younger self. If you're keen and you want to do it, do it. Most of us have wondered what advice we would give to our younger selves if we were to rewind the clock. What would we have changed? How could we have done things better? Could we have done anything better? In this episode, we'll be asking Arnott Coghill of Skinnet Farm in Holkirk, Caithness, exactly that. The Coghill family have been farmers for generations, farming in the local area but settled across two locations, Hillhead Farm near Wick in the 1890s and then in the 1950s here at Skinnet Farm just outside Holkirk. Farming has been in Arnott's blood since a very young age. He never considered doing anything else in life other than farming. After moving to Skinnet in 1971, along with his brothers, he left school and began working on the family farm. I'm Arnott Kogel and we trade as D. Kogel and Sons. I farm here with two brothers and we have another brother that works on another farm 20 miles from here. We're sheep cattle farmers, mostly, farming about 1,700 acres in total. We grow enough crop, grain and silage, that we can be pretty much self-sufficient. It's a mixed farm with quite a lot of rough ground, shallow ground, which doesn't really lend its little cropping, maybe just so much. I've always been interested in farming. I never was going to do anything else. Like from, They took me from a lambing at the age of four and put me in the school, and I've been working with sheep ever since. Like all businesses, it can take many years to become established, and there can be obstacles along the way. We used to run a lot of cows and things has changed a bit. We've always changed as circumstances change. When a subsidy was on, on cows, we had a lot of cows. Our peak at cows was three, 432. But as the subsidy changed, we dropped the cows. We're only running half of that number of cows now and we're fattening everything. On the other farm, we buy in 200 store cattle uh, and finish them. On this farm, we buy in some stores, but it's, it's, it's mostly cows. We're running just in excess of a thousand ewes, mostly mules. The last two years we've been running Texel crosses, which we've been keeping the Texel mules and some Suffolk mules. And this year, a, well, this last two years, we've been lambing hogs. Mostly what we do, we're, we're fattening everything, so everything is going direct to abattoirs. It's mostly, mostly lambs last year went to Morrison's. A, and cattle mostly go to EBP and McIntosh Donald because we're, we're fattening everything. We sold maybe 200 ewe lambs last year. In fact, some of them went away into the south of England. And they're actually sold online. So there is an opportunity when people look at this things online, they see it. And we also do bull beef, of course. That's the other side of the cows. We started it about, oh gosh, a good number of years ago. There, there's good bits and bads a bit, bits of bull beef, but it certainly gets a job done a little quicker. We always think if, if you make a steer, you've got to summer them and then you've got to winter them, whereas with the bulls, you've just got to take them half through that first summer. We reckon the bull eats about two tonne of grain in his lifetime. And if you work with steers, he maybe doesn't eat so much, but if you take him over his whole lifetime, it's not such a huge difference. And the price difference is not a whole lot. So, would Arnott have changed anything? What's his advice to his younger self? There's nothing really springs to mind that you would say was a mistake. Some things you maybe do slightly wrong, but whether it's a mistake or not, it's, it's, it's part of a learning curve. If you're a new entrant or a young farmer, is don't wait for the opportunity. A time is right when you're ready. If you're keen and you want to do it, do it. And do what you want to do. If you're a livestock oriented farmer, go into livestock. But also do what there's money in. Breeds go out of fashion for a reason. Like it's no because people don't like them. It's usually because there's no money in them. So for new entrants especially, pick something that there's money in. It's a farm you've got, so you've got to make the best of it really. 
there's no really any point looking over a dike and envying your neighbour because that's how you know can get it. So it's, it, it's make the best of what you can, what you've got, and if you can improve it, improve it, and and if you can get a little bit more when the circumstances arrive and things like that, and do it, and always see an opportunity, even though it's, if it's an opportunity and it's going to stretch you a little bit, if it's going to make things better, do it. Don't wait. Don't get too set in your ways, and only take advice if it's relevant. Seeing something that's, that's going to help you, and take a bit of it, don't, you don't have a copy of it. Take what's relevant and what will do your business a little bit of good and make it easier. I always try to make it easier because the day is a, is a fixed length and there's no use chasing both ends out if you don't have to. Next, we're off to visit another business that saw an opportunity to develop. Tucked away in the far north of Scotland, just 30 miles from John O'Groats, is Balaclai Farm, home to Caithness Yarns. Graham Bethune's family have worked this land since the 1830s. The 50-acre croft is home to 260 breeding ewes, and the flock produces the high-end product of Caithness Yarns. My name is Graham Bethune. I am the proprietor and bottle washer and sole operator of Caithness Yarns. Caithness Yarns is a business I run off my farm. I take the, the wool from my sheep and wool from a select few others. I have it processed into top grade yarn and I direct sell it to the public. I run two main breeds here, North Country Cheviots. They're proper old-fashioned hill sheep. When I came home about 15 years ago, I sourced my sheep from a guy called Donny Stewart. He sold me my first 30-odd yews, and he had very old-fashioned style sheep. Folk of his generation had kept on making sheep the way that they'd always done, going back to my grandfather's time, when wool was the main thing. So they still had first rate wool, first rate skins. I also have a flock of one of Britain, one of Scotland's rarest native breeds. They're called Castle Milk Murrets. About eight years ago, I was at the Highland Show and uh, I was passing the Rare Breed Society's tent and I heard this call. And it was the distinctive cry of a Castle Milk Murret, which is sort of, I'm not happy. And I went in and this gorgeous wee brown sheep, he was there with a couple of lambs and I thought, oh, that's just so lovely. Graham's family have worked this land since the 1830s, but farming and its economics have changed dramatically in that time. What has that meant for Graham and the path he's chosen for his business? My grandfather's time at the end of the 1950s, he was running top grade cheviots here and they were dual purpose animals. Wool was the primary crop, lamb was the secondary crop. The top grade cheviot went to specialist buyers who sold it to Savile Row suit makers, top end gear, very high end stuff. And in, the, in today's money, it was worth to my grandfather 60 quid a kilo. So that was the economic basis for sheep farming around here. Then lamb was a bit of an extra and selling genetics was a little bit extra on top of that. Of course, that all dropped off a cliff. I just couldn't make it work at my scale of thing. At the time I was running 150, 180 yows and we were falling in between the cracks, not big enough to achieve better profitability by economy of scale. Often great business ideas come from unexpected places and for Graham the turning point came at shearing time. Then my good friend Helga Sinkler came back and set up her business, Hurricane Shearing. She was here shearing and I was looking at all this fantastic quality wool and I was thinking, right, we're going to make at least an attempt to make some more money with this. A lot of folk look for diversification in their farming businesses. This is what I've chosen to lean into mostly. And so far, so good. It's been four years to here and it's been an interesting ride. 
But whilst Graham's ambition is to recover some of the traditions of the past, for him it's key to keep looking forward too. He isn't afraid to take the best of current thinking and developments and apply them to his business. The last couple of years, what I've done is I've uh, made a stab at uh, improvement. I've crossed in onto about half my cheviots, I've crossed them onto Aberfield top. Now, Aberfields are a stabilised modern breed. They're a st stabilised cross of Blueface, Leicester and Texel, both of which have got very fine fleece. Graham also joined his local monitor farm programme. I found that with the tools that I was getting at the monitor farm meeting, I was particularly interested to find that actually economically I was raising the profitability of the farm by changing my farming practices. I'm running 40% more sheep than I've ever done. And if the grass ever grows, then we are going to have 20% more lambs. When you're managing a project, you can only ever have one main driver. And for most sheep farmers, it's lamb. Lamb growth, quick lamb growth, body weight, live weight gain. And I am going completely the other way with this. For me, my driver is wool quality. So what's next for Graham? Hopefully, when things open up again later in the year, we'll get back out there selling it to folk. Because the best way to sell really top grade yarn is to put it in your hands and say, feel. In the middle of the highlands of Scotland is Lairg, known for its annual sheep sale, which is the largest one-day sale of sheep in Europe. This is an area of crofting townships. At Achfrisch, there are about 15 crofts, all with small flocks or herds. The crofters share in a common grazing, where they can put stock to in the summer. This area has lots of crofting activity, but as with farming, there aren't many new people coming into the industry. I grew up in a council estate in a city down in Wales, and if somebody had said to me, did I ever think that I would be standing here now doing this, I would probably say not at all, but here I am. The croft here is approximately three hectares, so it's not what we would call a viable croft, so we've had to think outside the box as to what we can do to ensure that we have a sustainable enterprise here. We have just launched Lockview Rural Training. So here at Lockview Rural Training, we are hoping to provide an informal, practical, warm, welcoming family experience. Whether you are a young person wanting to get into agriculture and wanting to know more about rural skills, or whether you're a family that would just like to have that very much a practical experience of being around animals, being able to learn about animals and understand them, or whether you're an older person wanting to upskill. This has also then led on to years and years of actually seeing that we're losing young people to our area. There's no rural training here for young people. So last year, being furloughed, I decided to put pen to paper, put the business plan together, and nine months on, we're now standing in what is soon to be our new outdoor learning area. And from here, we're now going to be offering SQA rural skills to schools. We're also in the future hoping to be launching an NPA in Crofting, which is a great two-year course. And amongst all of that, we're going to be offering practical courses to adults as well. Our target market is actually young people, because for me, it's really, really important that we actually we retain youth in the area. Also, Crofting, unfortunately, when you look at the demographics and the age range in Crofting, there are more crofters over the age of 60 than there are below 40. We've got to address that problem, because if we don't address that now, Crofting's going to die out. What's going to happen to Crofting? So, and I just feel really passionately that Crofting, it, it has to be, you know, it's a heritage. It's, it's what the area is known for. So we have to do something about it. So young people is my priority. But in amongst that, I'm really passionate about being able to upskill others. So that could be, it could be an adult. It could be somebody that, like myself, came from a non-agricultural background and just, you know, decided let's just dip the toe, see where we go from this and who knows what the future may lead for them. The training centre, because again, 
we are working cross. So the idea is that when people are here, they get the hands-on experience. So as we are doing things, we'll be taking them around. They can be actively involved. So in a way, it makes our life a little bit easier, but also means that we can share our experiences, our day-to-day -day routine with others, and people can actually then get that physical hands-on practical experience. We've got this fantastic outdoor learning area here. This area is going to provide a really safe but bright, airy environment so that we can have, whether it's nursery people or OEPs here, they can be in here working with the animals. It's really safe. We've also got a fantastic training room that we'll show you. Uh, we were really lucky to have had funding secured by Highland Science Enterprise for that. We've got a range of animals here. We've got our critically endangered large black pigs. We've got horses, we've got hens, we've got our North Country Cheviots, and we're just shortly going to be introducing pedigree beef shorthorns as well to um, our range of animals. The courses are very practical hands-on, so they will range from grassland management, practical lambing, there's fencing courses, we've got lantern accredited courses, we've got SQA courses and also ASDAN courses, so a vast range of courses that will be available to anybody that is seeking to upskill or develop skills in agriculture. We've recently launched a website called www.lochviewruraltraining.co.uk you will find on there we have a bookings page, so all our courses are listed on there. During COVID, many people have taken part in online events to learn. Cara is hoping to give people a chance to get back to learning face to face. During the last year with COVID, unfortunately, you've not been able to go out and do any practical courses, but it's been really good to actually see that there's been a range of online courses, webinars. So through that, so I've been attending, there's been lambing courses, there's been nutrition courses, there's, you know, getting your sheep into good condition for putting to the top, there's resilience courses. There's just been a huge range and it's just really nice to spend, you know, the odd evening just to be sitting in front of the fire watching these courses. So again, I would recommend anybody to start, you know, interacting and watching some of these webinars because it's actually a really great way to develop knowledge, to develop your skills and actually Online, you meet in other people also. So what advice does Cara have for others who'd like to get involved in farming and crofting? My advice, if you're thinking about agriculture, I would say just go for it. There are so many programmes out there that help. What we're doing here by promoting agriculture, promoting crofting, you know, that's a start. We've also, you know, I personally, I've been on some of the FAST courses. So I've been involved in the resilience courses. And through that, that actually last year, again, made me sort of question, you know, how can I drive our croft enterprise forward? What is it that I want to do to make a sustainable future? There's also the FAST mentoring. I'm actually a mentor. So again, there's people like myself that can help people get into agriculture. So it doesn't matter whether you've got a little bit of experience or no experience. There's that opportunity out there. So in my advice is if you are somebody that's sitting there just now thinking, could I or couldn't I? My advice is just go for it. Diversifying into a business you have no direct experience of, especially when it involves inviting hundreds of people to your farm, is a bit daunting. But not for Barbara Gervin of Corrie Money Farm near Drumna Drochert. A good diversification has got to be complementary to other parts of the farm, parts of the business, and I um, also think it's got to be something you enjoy because the one thing in flower farming is people say you should never grow a flower that you don't like yourself because if you even if like your consumers love them you won't take that good care of them because you don't really love them yourself a few years ago barbara given decided to diversify a small part of the farm into a pumpkin patch and cut flower business aiming to provide local fresh flowers with a low carbon footprint with no experience of growing, but with a boost in confidence from doing the Rural Leadership Programme, Barbara pulled off a very popular pumpkin patch experience. They come, they pick their pumpkin, they enjoy a day sort of with lots of different wee activities and um, we've got a couple of local vendors that do hog roast and pumpkin donuts and coffees, which is really nice and um, yeah, it's just a, quite an enjoyable time for, for us and for everybody else and it's really nice because they all 
come and visit the farm in a short period of time, so it's quite intense, but it's, it's good. We've actually developed a relationship with the school in Glasgow. We've been doing live videos with them, and it's really interesting the questions the children have. You think they want to know one thing, and you go onto the call thinking, right, we'll do this and we'll do that, and then they take you down some other completely different route maybe because of their experiences, but also you just don't think about what conceptions they already have or misconceptions. I think education is really important and I'm keen to keep involved with that. And There's a lot of bodies that are really good at getting education out there to schools about farms, but I think we could be doing a lot more. And I think farmers could be doing a lot more, actually. So how does the pumpkin enterprise fit around the farming at Corrie Mooney? It's actually quite good timing because um, I'll plant seeds end of lambing, so nobody needs to help me with that, I can do that all myself. Um, and then when it comes to transplanting we do that at the start of June, so there's not just an awful lot going on at the start of June, so a couple of days of everybody helping works quite well. And then when it comes to harvest, we harvest in probably early September, depending on the weather. And again, it's a fairly quiet time, so um, I don't have to shout too loud to get help. <laughs> and then when it comes to the events, again, it's a fairly quiet time and everyone quite enjoys helping with those events, I think. Or that's, that's what I think. <laughs> everyone just pulls together and it's, it's really nice. So these are the like new beds that went in this year. We only just put the polytunnel up in January and the last year's wheel clip was actually still sitting in the shed. It never got put off because um, it doesn't really make enough money to have gone to the hassle to put it off, basically. We bought all these rolls of black plastic and I didn't, but I didn't really want to put black plastic everywhere. You know, you want to reduce uh, your use of plastic as much as possible. So um, I came, well, I dread somewhere about this use of wheel and we took them over and actually it's, it's worked really well, I've been quite pleased with it. It's, um, it keeps the bed, it, it retains the moisture um, and I also think once we get further down the line, because it's white, it'll have um, reflective properties for growing and um, so the, the le it should help leaves um, to absorb light, so uh, that should be good and I'm really excited to be able to use it. It doesn't look good but um, it's free. <laughs> it's quite an exciting time with everything that might have gone on in the last year, whether it be coronavirus or Brexit or, you know, what have you. And there, there are a lot of potential positives to come from Brexit. We may not see them yet, but I think in the long term, there's a lot of things that, um, you know, could be, could be good for us. And I think diversification is, if it's something you're inclined to do, I would... I would always say go for it because you just never know what, what will come of, of these ideas. So it's early June and we're in Ayrshire and thankfully the, the weather's improved, the temperatures come up a bit and the grass has begin, begun to grow. With this rise in temperature though, the, the parasite nematodiris has, has taken advantage of this and the, the warm weather has triggered a, a mass emergence of infective larvae on the, on the pasture. So across all of Scotland we've seen outbreaks of, of diarrhoea and deaths in lambs due to, due to diarrhoea from the nematodiris worm. It's lambs that are about this sort of age, that are sort of six to eight weeks of age, that, that are susceptible to this condition because they're just beginning to ingest significant amounts of grass and along with it ingest the, the, the infective larvae. So if you do have outbreaks of diarrhoea, do ensure you get them investigated with your vet quickly. And if you're treating for nematodiris, discuss with your vet when the best time to submit faecal samples is. This lets us check that the product has been infective and it also lets us check if there are any other concurrent diseases going on, if there's coccidiosis or other types of worms there as well. Last month, similar to May last year, we had lots of reports of cows exhibiting pica, so that's when they eat weird things, they're ingesting soil, stones, some cows have been even ripping up astroturf from, from cow tracks. We've seen this particularly in spring calving dairy herds that are making the most out of grass and colleagues across the UK have seen this, this condition as well. We're not 100% sure what's causing it, 
We think it's most likely to be a deficiency in maybe sodium or phosphorus, or possibly in some, some circumstances it can be because of um, subacute ruminal acidosis. But if you do have this condition, please do speak to your vet because that's how we get to know about, about this condition going on across the country. And we are working with colleagues across the UK to try and find out more about this condition. Both in our post-mortem rooms and in on-farm post-mortem examinations that vets have been doing across the country, we've seen lots of cases of pastrolosis in recent weeks. So that could be causing either pneumonia or, or septicemia and sudden death. This has typically been in calves and lambs aged about one to two months. And this could be due to declining maternally derived antibody levels or perhaps other stresses in some parts of the, the country. We've had really warm days and then cold nights, so that's a stress. Or perhaps intercurrent disease, maybe from, from tick-borne disease or trace element deficiencies. So one condition that we've seen in June in previous years that we don't want to see again is deaths associated with inhalation of mineral drenches. So this is when lambs are being supplemented maybe with, with copper drenches, for example, and instead of the drench being swallowed and going down the gullet, it's accidentally gone into the airway. And the, the irritant nature of the, the drench has caused real damage to the airways and a, a problem with the, the lungs as well, perhaps resulting in deaths soon after drenching or maybe even up to one or two weeks after drenching. So it's really important if you're giving mineral supplements to make sure that time is taken, it's done carefully, and your technique is good. Speak to your vet about that and also speak to your vet about whether it's necessary because sometimes overdosing on, on these sorts of compounds can cause problems with toxicity as well. Earlier in spring, we mentioned that we were interested to hear of any suspect cases of Schmallenberg virus infection causing congenital malformations in calves or lambs. We've not had any evidence that Schmallenberg virus has been circulating in Scotland this year, but we have in the last couple of weeks diagnosed a calf with these malformations born from an imported dairy heifer. So the, the heifer was imported from Europe. It was infected in the early stages of pregnancy whilst in Europe, but the, the manifestation of the disease wasn't evident until calving time. So it's important if people are importing cattle that they're aware that this could be a risk and discuss this risk with their, with their own vet. And we are carrying on surveillance for this condition in this country as well. well I hope that gives you a, a flavour of what we've been up to this month and we'll give you another update in July. I'm Raymond and welcome to the Rural Roundup. This week in farming we have seen some welcome heat which has boosted grass growth and helped to bulk out our silage crops. With this heat we must watch out for nematodiris in your lambs and also fly strike in your sheep. A reminder of the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme deadline on the 30th of June. This is for those of you considering organic conversion or maintenance, environmental schemes on the triple SI areas public access or slurry storage. Please remember that only slurry lagoons and slurry towers are eligible under the slurry storage option. You must not have had a slurry storage grant previously under SRDP. You must provide your entire business with six months of storage and that slatted concrete tanks are not eligible. The Scottish Government has also announced support to help cover the cost of an EECS scheme application and this is up to £600 for a moorland application, up to £300 for lowland bogs. Finally, best wishes to Fergus Ewing, and we welcome along our new Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and the Islands, Mary Goujong. Stay tuned for more from FAS TV and the Farm Advisory Service. Next time on FAS TV. We're in the northeast of Scotland learning about farm diversification and vending machines. We'll look at improving suckler cow efficiency and reducing your farm's carbon footprint.